We got the cure, we got the answer to what's happening in society. We got the power to solutions and provide the healing that you need. We got the cure, we got the answer with discussions that will set you free. This is the Ark Republic, and you're listening to The Remedy. The Remedy. The Remedy. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, welcome to the Remedy Podcast. It has been a month of Sundays since we've had a Remedy Podcast, but it is so great to start with somebody I think is extremely dope, extraordinarily dope. Mia Donovan, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Mia Donovan is a Canadian filmmaker based in Montreal. She has a series of films, but tonight or today we're going to talk about Dope is Death, a film that chronicles um, a group of activists in the New York area, uh, the Young Lords, Black Panther Party, who come together in order to implement a radical revolutionary um, program using acupressure and acupuncture in order to treat drug addiction and specifically heroin at the rise of the, the heroin epidemic then uh, in, um, in the Bronx uh, in, in the 1970s. But I'm gonna let her tell more of it. Um, so welcome to the show. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So the, 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 the first question is, is that what is a woman from Canada, a white woman from Canada gonna talk about some you know, Puerto Rican and black kids doing revolutionary things um, in the Bronx in New York and in Harlem in the seventies. Yeah, well, it's um, the, how I learned about it was through my acupuncturist in Montreal. His name's Mario Wexu. And back, I mean, there's, it's a long story, but just to s- sum it up. So Mario Wexu was the guy who, the teacher who taught Matula Shakur, the Young Lords and the Black Panthers acupuncture in the 1970s because Montreal had the first acupuncture teaching school in North America, like outside of Chinatown, but it was French. And Mario's father was the one who ran the school, but they were so impressed by what they were trying, what the activists were already trying to do in the South Bronx to treat their community that they offered them scholarships to come up here. So when I was receiving acupuncture at Mario's home, I noticed a poster on the wall, which you see in the film, that said, uh, we will fight heroin and methadone by any means necessary, educate the people. And there was like drawings of black hands with acupuncture needles. And I was just like, what is this poster? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then he started to tell me about the story. And then I started to correspond with Dr. Matula Shakur. So it's sort of, that was years ago. That's how it began. And and explain Dope is Death. The the title? Yes. It comes from a political slogan that they had that the Lincoln Detox members had back in the mid seventies. So it does, they were very, very like, you know, extreme, extremely anti-drugs. So that it was part of the slogan of the time. Uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly where it comes from but I just kept seeing it around old flyers and, and references. So mm-hmm. the name just sort of stuck. Um, but there has been some pushback from the harm reduction community that- Oh, interesting. But, you know, they, when I explain, they understand because today um, the harm reduction community is, is, I believe, an extension of what they were doing. Could but you explain that? The harm, the harm reduction thing? community is like uh, when we see the five point, the five point acupuncture protocol is used a lot in these this this pro, these programs. And it's instead of being anti drugs, it's like we are here to help users or anyone become healthier so they don't turn people away. Mm -hmm. if they're high or they're using it's about like you know the approach is like the healthier you you get the more love you receive the less you'll want to use Mm -hmm. and so dope is death reifies a negative existence or something well dope is death in their eyes they see it as like drugs are bad you know Uh, like like really just like a really like hard you know and it's stigmatized really stigmatizing like you know if you're a user you're on the wrong side but Oh, okay, like up to drugs, nope to dope, crack is whack. Okay, yeah, gotcha. More okay. in that, but for them, I think it was just, you know, there were 20, that, that there's a, 
um, overzealousness of the political message, but I think that in reality, you know, it's, oh. yeah. Mm -hmm. How long did it, when did you start working on the project? How long did it take to finish? Well, the first time uh, I started corresponding with Matulu, Dr. Matulu Shakur in 2013, and I finished it in 2020. But the original plan was Dr. Shakur was supposed to be released in 2016. And it was going to be a bit of a reunion between Mario and Dr. Shakur and him, you know, kind of fo following him as he goes back into the community, the community and continues his work, but he was not released. So at that point, I was really emotionally invested in telling the story and wanted to raise awareness of, you know, this history that not a lot of people were aware of and raise more awareness of Dr. Shakur's political case. And then I started to reach out to other people and Matulu put me in touch with most of the people who were involved in this program and just started to collect interviews of first person accounts and then started to pursue it as a, you know, pursue uh, raising the funds to finish the film. Right, and I also read that um, on um, matulushakur.org on the website that he was denied parole in January 2021, which would have, which makes the ninth time of him being denied parole. So we'll start present day where um, Dr. Matula Shakur is, and then we'll travel back and then we'll go back. So can you please give a, a summary of his, um, his political standing? Uh, what's going on with that? Well, it's, uh... Dr. Shakur was convicted under the RICO Act, uh, which is a very complicated law that was originally invented to, um, to get to the mafia. So the government basically, the court alleged that he, him and his, the associates, and associates involved in a series of crimes were a political organization because of their political uh, association. So it's a, there's, it's very complicated to get into, but basically there's no physical evidence linking Dr. Shakur to the crimes. And at the time he was sentenced to, the law changed in 1988, but he was sentenced to a 60 year sentence with a mandatory 30 year parole. But it, it because of the gray area of that time that there, there has been, um, the, they just, the, a judge is, nobody wants to sign for his release. So he's basically being withheld under, um, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little tongue tied, but basically he's, he should have been released in 2016. He's not mm -hmm. right now. He has stage four can, uh, bone marrow cancer. Okay. He's been denied compassionate release. His next parole date is 2022. It's, you know, he's, oh, he's an elder. He's over 70. He's not a threat to society. And, you know, we're, there's, it's, it's, it's about, about examining the, the prison system and you know what do we do with all the elders in prison and yeah we talked about that um on arc republic in terms of um aging uh and in prison and specifically political prisoners who have been subjected to um even more severe treatment while they are incarcerated and he also um had COVID 19 too as well um yeah, in fact, he had it twice wow wow so, so we're talking about, um, you know, somebody who has quote unquote served the time and is kind of grandfathered into these kind of murky waters of not necessarily mass incarceration, but these antiquated laws that, um, and, and, and uh, what, how do I want to say this? Maybe like the COINTEL program that existed uh, in the 1960s and 70s in order to neutralize organizations, radical revolutionary organizations, not only exclusively black led organizations, but they were certainly at the forefront in terms of being targeted. Yes, and the COINTELPRO successfully, you know, um, managed to label all people like Dr. Shakur as terror domestic terrorists. Like they're considered, they've been labeled as very dangerous, criminals that need to be locked up, which is, you know, and say, so no judge wants to politically release them. It, it's just a very, it's, it's basically COINTELPRO in practice. 
Mm-hmm. So, so let's get, sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. So let's get into, so now that we know uh, where uh, Dr. Shakur is, let's get into the movie because it's a very complex story. You're weaving several stories in. So we're talking about this moment where you have uh, multiple organizations, as you show uh, in, uh, in the documentary, uh, multiple organizations, young people, revolutionary organizations emerging who don't have anything to lose and everything to gain, right? And challenging the government's healthcare system, political system, a um, system of economy, uh, and they're using, you know, what people might consider the throwaways of society, the dope fiends, right? So how did you decide to weave these multiple stories? Could you give me insight in terms of what that looked like? Yeah, I, I mean, I felt it was very important to understand how revolutionary and how progressive and how um, just amazing the, the program that these young activists created at the Lincoln Detox in 1970 was to, we needed to understand the, the political context, the socioeconomic context. So a lot of, um, while I was editing the stories, I would interview people um, who were there and experienced this firsthand. And then I would, you know, take notes on dates and like you try and like find archives and stuff in different images to, and music and art to sort of try and visually bring us back to that era as much as possible, as much as I could basically, because things have changed so much and to really understand the landscape in which they were, res that they were responding to as activists, trying to provide needs, immediate need, like the demands to immediate needs of the community. Like they're, these activists were going around door to door um, asking people, what do you need help with? And, mm -hmm. you know, elders or like the community would say, we need help, uh, the, they're not picking up the garbage. So they had a garbage initiative and people were like, you know, I'm scared to go to the hospital. The community called the Lincoln Hospital, the butcher shop. And they would say, well, why? And it's like, well, there was no, it was mostly 70% Puerto Rican in the South Bronx and there was barely any Spanish speaking nurses or doctors. So that was something that they were concerned with. And then the lack of drug treatment. So they were really just trying to find a way to keep their community healthy. And to that was their political action was like, how do we provide services and basic needs for people? So, so, so when do the young lords emerge in this story? And who are the young lords and when do they emerge? So the young lords were the Puerto Rican counterpart to the Black Panthers. They were very influenced by the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers started a few years earlier. The young lords originally started in Chicago, but the New York organization started in 68 or 69. And they really, that's how they describe themselves as we, were, we are the Puerto Rican counterpart to the Black Panthers. So doing the same kind of programs like free breakfast programs for children, um, you know, just basic community needs. And the heroin epidemic in, in America, in the US, 25% of the heroin users were concentrated in New York City. It was a huge, huge problem. Wow. And methadone maintenance centers were popping up really quickly. There were everywhere and there was a lot of problems that they they were they really saw the connection between the government and the methadone programs right away like methadone was connected to access to welfare or some public housing and parole and they just they were very suspicious of methadone mm -hmm. um, can, so can i can, can i add some context to this because yes, we've been, we've been talking about since you know dmx passed uh, you know within the week uh and these issues to dealing with addiction um, and, and, and crack, we were talking about this on one of the shows. Um, so in the 70s, the late 60s, early 70s, this is the waning um, definite, well, civil rights is gone. This is the rise of the children of the civil rights movement who didn't inherit what the civil rights said it was or what it was supposed to do. But what did happen, the response of the government was pull money out of the urban areas right? 
um, totally defund housing projects that were already dilapidating, dilapidated and falling apart. And, and what, um, what, what, what we were talking about and what we learned was part of these uh, programs in order to neutralize the rise or the continued rise of these groups is to dump drugs in the communities. And so heroin being flooded into the South Bronx and other communities, but specifically in New York is very intentional, is very purposeful. And now you have addicts um, that are, uh, you know, an everyday reality uh, as well as plummeting housing. Uh, and then you have the freeways that are coming in and they're tearing down. So there is this kind of apocalyptic existence that's going on in places like the South Bronx. And these young folk that are there are trying to institute change. And they were like, we need to borrow what the Black Panthers and these other groups are doing is radical revolutionary action. So correct me if I'm wrong, add or subtract. You said it amazing. Yeah, that's, okay. Um, okay. yeah, great. Uh, like, I got you, girl. I got you, girl. You know, because this is the part of history that is missed. So that's right. why this film is so critical, right? So, um, so what happens in, what happens in 1970 at the Lincoln Hospital? That's important. Well, um, and so, you know, continuing from what you just said, they were aware of the role who drugs served in a society. They understood it as a chem as part of a chemical warfare. Mm -hmm. And they also, it, it, this, the, how the Lincoln detox program started is connected to healthcare, like a larger healthcare concerns. And they really understood that, you know, to control the people, if you can control the people's health, you can control the people. And they wanted to have a say in how the hospital was serving their community. So they took over the hospital. And I mean, by they, I mean, members of the Young Lords and the Black Panther Party. And they actually, this is 1970, they actually literally took it over and were able to communicate with the city and the city gave them, granted them some of their demands, which one of them was to start a drug detoxification unit. Although, not to get too much in the details, but there was two takeovers, one in July and one in October. So in October, mm -hmm. that was for the detoxification program. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, they wanted, their goal was to politicize, to educate the community on who drugs really serve and why the community mm -hmm. needs to resist drugs. And um, the response like, you know, like the drugs are used, both heroin and methadone to pacify resistance in these communities and to get people off drugs. So at the beginning, they were doing a 10 day methadone detox, which already was, nobody was doing that. Everybody, the majority of the programs were methadone maintenance. So you had to go every single day. You know, you, the, they understood the withdrawal, you know, how, how hard it was to withdraw off heroin and methadone. Um, and then eventually they discovered acupuncture, which the story is Matul was in Chinatown with one of his comrades and went to a storefront and witnessed an elderly, an elder woman treating someone with moxibustion and acupuncture and then was like, okay, what if we bring this to treat the secondary symptoms and the symptoms of withdrawal? So that's how that all started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a long, it's hard to sum up, but you know, there are so many motivations, but to them, it was really like, let's, Drugs were a part of a larger uh, health system. Like it was like, not just drugs was connected to the, they had a very holistic view of addiction. And I think also what I saw in the, the documentary is, is that drug addiction was, as you said, was part of healthcare, which was also part of uh, food justice, what they call now, which is part of healthy communities. So there was some, it, it's, it's really interesting that, that the organizations that get targeted are organizations that are just simply trying to make communities healthy, right? It's really, that's a really ill thing because they kept talking about healthcare, health, healthcare. Like you said, I don't want to give the, the full movie away because the movie is available. Is it still available on Vice? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, are, if there are any other, are there any other ways that we could see it or is it just on Vice? 
for now it's just on Vice, but starting May 1st, it's going to be available um, a, a lot more places. I like, okay. um, I too, it's, I'm not exactly sure yet where, but it's going to have a wider release. Okay, 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 so. good. Please check this movie out. But I, um, I also thought was very fascinating at, uh, with the point where people were talking about while they were receiving treatment, they were also getting politically educated. Right. So this becomes also and this goes to your point is, is that the site of healing is not just dealing with the actual addiction itself, but understanding the role that it plays in the oppression of, 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 of the people and how some of the biggest proponents of the um, not only just the, the program, but just demanding power and, and, and equity in the community become the, the, the people who were nodding off in the middle of the street, literally, you know, weeks before. I thought that that was extremely, extremely powerful. What are some important, um, what is important information or ideas that you felt were necessary to circulate through this documentary? Um, I think uh, there's so many that it's hard to just, I mean, for me as, I come from Canada, so we have always, healthcare isn't the same thing. And then the, the idea that how political and how inaccessible healthcare can be to certain communities or have been historically in the US, it's just such a huge injustice. And I really, when I first met Mario Wexo, the acupuncture teacher, he described it all in terms of like barefoot doctors of China and how he was training these activists to play that role, to like send healthcare worker, to send, to provide basic healthcare training to a community that didn't have access to healthcare. Mm -hmm. And the role, like what Matulu always says when I would visit him is that how important it was for people of color to, uh, to learn how to treat their own community like towards self-determination. So that's um, really important, but I think for me, maybe like the connection between, I have addicts in my family who've gone through like 12 step programs and methadone and stuff. And there's always this emphasis on like the me, you know, like taking personal responsibility, which is not new. That's been going on for decades with 12 step programs, AA. And what they were doing is really like providing a, a like a, different perspective lens to view addiction like that it's not just about you it's like society and like you know the the role between being a person of color in, in a context of white supremacy and how these concepts can be how white supremacy is internalized and can lead to uh addiction as a form of escape like they really had this interesting lens where it's like the, to build community like it's not just you against the world it's like here's a community, we have to look at society differently. And I also think that um, it was not only just a physical detox, it was like a detox of the whole community, right? Uh, I, I was just like thinking about all these like just very kind of interesting um, like ideas interwoven into that and, and, and the power uh, that the community got eventually um, or, or the, the maybe I should say the power that the community harnessed, you know, as a result of the work. Um, eventually, the Lincoln Ho Lincoln Hospital, um, the the detox center, comes in um, under. Could you briefly talk about that? What happens to the young lords? What happens to the program? And what happens to Dr. Shakur? Yeah, I mean, so we have to visualize like this is a program that was funded by the city, the health and hospital corporation in New York city. They were run in, they had a politically run clinic. They, um, they, so in the beginning they were doing the 10 day de methadone detox and by 75, they were pretty much, they were not using detox or methadone. Um, wow. but yet they were funded under this program that was meant to dispose methadone as a treat. Mm -hmm. That was the only real recognized, you know, treatment for heroin addiction at that time. So once they stopped using methadone, it became hard. There was some tension because it was harder to, for the city, the health and hospital corporation to understand 
like where the money was going and they didn't they just couldn't understand like what the they called them political education classes like what that meant and you know so they started there was some tension and um basically as soon as they stopped using methadone um and by 1978 this grew and the city shut down the clinic at the time, uh, Chuck Schumer was the assemblyman and he was quoted saying how it was a rip off drug treatment program and that they were addicts would go in and become indoctrinated as, you know, political radicals. So there was just a lot of like, um, you know, like, of course, just um, red flags from the city, like they just didn't understand. So they shut it down. And then um, everybody sort of went their own way. Dr. Shakur and some of the activists went to Harlem and started the Black Acupuncture Association of North America, advisory, Black Acupuncture Advisory Association of North America, mm -hmm. which was a private clinic. So they no longer had the funding of the city. So it became a much more um, difficult program to really keep going uh, in terms of just not having that same access to people because it was a smaller program um but it you know it it eventually also came under extreme attack um surveillance by the government um so that basically right left. then tur turns to the to the chain of events um that leads him into um incarceration right now as a i, I wrote it down and i'm it's, it's kind of like a double back but but coming coming in right so I put as a Canadian who's had access to affordable health care um, or universal health care system your whole life. Are there moments where you don't really c comprehend exactly why the United States has something like this? Or do you feel this story explains why? That's interesting. Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, like for, you know, coming from Canada, like still today, I'm just shocked, you know, like with COVID, just like healthcare, why that, why there's so much political opposite, you know, just it, that's like a whole, obviously I, I think it's, everyone should have access to healthcare. I don't understand you know, I mean, I understand, you know, in the US that that's just not the case. It's just hard, to, it is hard to understand, to, to imagine mm -hmm. that that, I, it's something I don't have to worry about here. Mm -hmm. But um, when you look at it in terms of a ra race in America and privilege and white supremacy, it's, it's hard not to just see it as completely political and a sign of, it's, it's just complete injustice in a way um, to use the language of the Lincoln detox, it's like they saw it as like cultural genocide and really like a way of controlling people that they wanted to, the government, controlling a population that they wanted to keep under control. Mm -hmm. If you don't have access to healthcare, it's really, you're very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I mean, to me, it's just, I, I it makes so much sense that they would want to take that into their own hands you know like there's so much reason for people of color to not trust the western medical system or the dominant medical system and to want to learn how to treat their own people with acupuncture because i might i, I want to point out that once dr shakur and everyone went to the to bana they were treating everything they were trained they have their in montreal to treat all Sim uh, to treat the full body like any any symptoms so it became much more of a bigger program right because as i understand it they were providing holistic therapy before they were even certified yeah right so it was it's kind of in my opinion how you describe it it's like uh the, the it, you know what there were things that we are seeing now that were pushing to be implemented then. So this whole idea of using community workers to have some kind of like, not pseudo, but kind of be a community health givers. That is exactly what you're talking about. They do that around the whole world now. You train community workers to do these basic health um, 
uh, what do you call it, health services and, and, and pr provide that, the barefoot, <laughs> the barefoot doctors. Another thing that was, um, that, that struck me um, a lot is, is that I, I really liked it when um, um, Dr. Shakur talks about, this is before he's certified that at the point where all they were doing were just massaging their ears mm -hmm. and giving them a massage and massaging their feet and how just that level of being touched. See, a lot of, we, we have these conversations in, when you go to the hospital, a lot of people don't even want to touch black and brown bodies, right? A lot of people don't even think black and brown people hurt or in, the, in pain, the capacity in which, which we are. I thought that was very interesting how touch becomes part of the therapy. Yeah, and like Matulu talks a lot about how, yeah, just like the, the acupressure points, the breathing, and he still does that inside prison. He teaches breathing exercises and he does acupuncture pressure point to his, um, you know, the people he's with. Mm -hmm. um, and just this, I also, I just wanted to point out that they were, it, that we don't get into this in the documentary, but they were teaching people about like, um, you know, like, uh, vegetarian diets and like you know the um, just like healthy eating like there was just so many different things yoga meditation you know they were doing all of this stuff there and what's also little known and I don't know much about it but there was also a clinic um, to treat uh, to give hormones to transgender people at the, the same clinic, really? which I have to find out more about. And Matula mentioned it a few times. I asked a few people. There was, a, there was like, they were doing a lot of wow. stuff in this. I mean, this is very, <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 very revolutionary. The first thing that, you know, when I'm looking at it, I was like, it's clear. This messed up the legalized dope game of America. First of all, let's talk about like methadone, right? Yeah. Because when you take methadone, you're on methadone your whole life, right? That maintenance, right? Yeah. So we're talking about something that totally disrupts, uh, you know, prescription medicine, methadone. Um, so that's one of the things I was thinking about when I was lo looking at that, that it, it's a total disruption. Another um, aspect. I thought the irony of how this program was attacked and um, dismantled, but it also had um, its own limbs and branches. So can we talk about what, even though um, this closes down the Harlem Institute of Acupuncture um, that gets disbanded, what happens to those who were impacted by this type of acupuncture that is initiated uh, in the area? Do you mean um, like with the lack of treatment or you mean like the continue, like what happened? Um, well, there's a- No, go ahead. Um, so with the Lincoln detox at the Lincoln hospital, when they shut the program down, they basically got rid of, um, you know, the, the activists in the program, but kept this one doctor, Dr. Michael Smith, Mm -hmm. to continue on with just the acupuncture. So stripping away the political uh, um, education and the politics mm -hmm. and ju to just a standardized five point ear acupuncture protocol that they all developed. Dr. Matula Shakur, Mario Wexu, Walter Bosque and Dr. Michael Smith was there also. But Dr. Michael Smith incorporated in 1985 and today what we know is NADA, National Acupuncture Detox Association is being used all around the world to treat withdrawal symptoms, anxiety, trauma. There was a tent put up with practitioners after 9-11 to treat first responders. Like it's been used mm -hmm. all over the world, but people until recently uh, thought it, it was invented by Dr. Michael Smith, a white doctor in 1985. Um, he passed away a few years ago and myself and others, not just myself, but have been writing and really digging into this history. And now NADA is embracing the real history. Like they're, 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 um, they're, which is amazing. And um, obviously, so they, you know, that's just part of the story too. Just this like Michael Smith really whitewashed it in a lot of ways. You know, he really just made it this kind of almost like a fast food version. It's just like these five points, no politics, like just, you know, it's easy to use, it's effective. But even today, the clinic that we shoot in, Nairi, 
which is a harm reduction clinic in in across New York, the one we were at the one in Harlem, and they treat people with they're not supposed to be political. It's a you know they're a very small clinic. They have a little bit of funding, but it is political. Just what they're doing by nature. Everybody who works there, they're like this is political because we're providing this service and this community space for people who you know, the, 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 who are not, whose society is somehow not, who's failed in some way, you know, like, so. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. That's exactly <laughs> what I was, I was trying to niceify the question, right? Yeah. Um, of how it has so many tentacles, mm -hmm. right? What happens? And it becomes, it becomes so many things. It becomes something else. I'm glad it's returning back to, the source um, and the real source. I have a, a question. This is something you might not know. Is this type of acupuncture, the cultural, political um, ideologies that are connected to it? Is this, was, was this something that was taken to Cuba? Because I know in Cuba, acupuncture is um, used a lot because of the embargo and not having, you know, all this access. There is this dope healthcare system um, in Cuba. Is this part of it? Does this has, yeah. Well, I do know, I don't, I, I haven't investigated the thread, you know, like in terms of really just investigating, but yes, I mean, there's people who were at Lincoln Detox and at, at, at uh, Bana who are in Cuba. Mm -hmm. who, so this, um, I'm sorry. There's a connection, but I'm not sure with the roots. I didn't, I just don't want to say things I'm not entirely educated on, but there definitely is a connection, but I'm not sure to what, if it, there isn't, I don't know about the independent movement aside from mm -hmm the link so mm -hmm. yeah, because, yeah I'm trying to yeah th that was a qu like what what where did everybody go right so what, what was the dispersal um after things totally um were shut down well there are some people who did end up in Cuba uh some people when things like when it's some people stayed on, some people part who were part of the original collective did stay on with Dr. Michael Smith and continued the great work of Lincoln recovery, even though it changed a lot. Uh, after the activist and the political component left, they were still providing free acupuncture to people. It was, it, it went on for years until 2011, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of people were trained there and it really did help spread this treatment around the world. Other people went to Bana. Other people just went back to the streets or their world or whatever, because it just became harder to practice. And they had to just, you know, like Walter Bosque had five children. So he had to just focus on his home. Um, mm -hmm. And then he's recently come back to it. But um and then, of course, the clinic Bana became heavily surveyed uh, in the 80s um, because of political associations and certain events that were linked to people involved with the clinic and mm -hmm. which, you know, was Asada Shakur being liberated to Cuba, uh, the famous Brinks armed truck robbery in 1981. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so there was this huge case where Matulu was singled out as the mastermind of this criminal organization. So can I, so can we segue, because that's the part we're going to focus on is, is that maybe people who are not familiar fully with um, Dr. Shakur's case is, is that why is a man who has, who, who helped co-build a program uh, to help heroin addicts and other addictions and just heal the community be a political prisoner currently. What makes that so political, right? So this is the, the, the segment that we wanna to talk about so people can understand. So with that question, what makes his, him, his incarceration a political prisoner? So this is a good segue into talking about that and him being tied to Shakur. For those of you, you know, Matulu Shakur, Dr. Shakur um, is the stepfather of Tupac. Yes. Um, Shakur. So he's, he is intertwined in the Black Panther Party. I'm going to let you, I'm just going to be a fly on the wall listening now. <laughs> well, Dr. Shakur is, you know, he, number one, everything he does is political. He's a political activist. He was involved with the Republic of New Africa um, since the 60s. And they were um, uh, 
uh, an organization, a more nationalist Black organization who were working towards reparations, reconciliation, and a, a, a separate Black nation. Mm -hmm. um, so they were considered, of course, extremely dangerous in the eyes of like COINTELPRO, uh, J. Mm -hmm. Edgar Hoover. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a time J. Edgar Hoover said that the Black Panthers, like the the black the bre free breakfast program that the Black Panthers were providing for children was considered a very dangerous program. Like, you know, so this is like a very, any rise of the of a black movement was was heavily, uh, you know, the COINTELPRO gave instructions to s neutralize and disrupt and um, basically, you know, prevent the rise of any black nationalist organizations. And mm -hmm. so Matulu was sur under surveillance since 1968. He found mm -hmm. his COINTELP, his FBI papers and COINTELP pro, pro papers. So. Basically, you know, we have somebody who, if we look at Dr. Shakur as an individual, he was extremely charismatic. He, his work in the community, he was able to mobilize and inspire people to, to do good work, to right. heal their community, to get involved with, um, you know, uh, things like rent strikes. Um, mm -hmm. He was concerned with political prisoners since the 70s, since the early 70s. He was investigating COINTELPRO. He was really aware of these organizations. And, you know, he was considered a quote unquote potential black messiah, um, somebody who the government wanted to keep an eye on. So. Right. And what we, what we know is, is that, um, you know, under J. Edgar Hoover, there was, um, concerted efforts in order to neutralize and kill or prevent the rise of what they call the Black Messiah, like the, the recent movie Judas and the, the, and the Black Messiah, right? So. And that movie, it's a great, like, like in parallel with Fred Hampton, Matulu was one of these individuals who were considered somebody to keep an eye on by the, the government. So, you know, if we look at it from that point of view, here was a man who was really vocal, who was confronting Big Pharma, who was confronting the war on drugs, who was, um, you know, organizing people, the Black community towards self-determination. These were all considered, this made him a target and somebody to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. So the events that happened that led to his incarceration, um, it's a very, I can't speak, there was a lot of people involved. The actions right. have to be understood in the political context. But what we know in terms of just the legal system and the laws, because of the RICO charges, there was no physical evidence linking him or indicating he was present at any of the crimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, the RICO case, it, it, you know, you, you can just have, um, you can, they, they were able to, arrest and bring in people just on, you know, association. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, because, you know, Dr. Shakur was, um, as you said, under the RICO conspiracy laws, he was also um, linked to uh, being part of an armed bank robbery where a guard and two police officers um, were killed. Um, um, in the trial, there was a key witness who is alleged to have actually been one of the shooters, but um, becomes um, a witness um, who, who, who then testifies against Shakur um, and other members. And so Shakur goes to jail along with Marilyn Buck um, as well, who ser served a considerable amount of time. Just a, a quick side note, I think it's very interesting that a lot of these political prisoners who are in from this era are developing cancer in prison. Yeah. Right. I think this is really kind of interesting. Like I, I don't, and I don't think it's a coincidence, but I think it's really interesting. I think soon, um, um, was it Sudiata Coley? I, 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 I would, cause we've done several stories and I'm like, wow, this is like the fourth or fifth person that um, um, has developed ca um, cancer. What do you want this overall? What do you want this documentary to do? Um, I mean, I, in one hand, like, uh, you know, with Dr. Shakur's case and him being labeled as this, um, 
very dangerous criminal, you know, like, or just like the, just the way that the COINTELPRO has criminalized this movement, I want to provide a counter narrative and like, so people understand the, the context of, you know, what, what it means to be a political prisoner. Also just like, it's just super inspiring to see these young activists who are 20, mm -hmm. uh, 20, 21 years old, finding solutions to heal their community that were, you know, that, that were just going against the system in a way and how this can be criminalized, how this can be seen as a threat. It's just shocking, you know, and it's um, that this amazing work, this caring, loving community work has, was just seen as such a threat. And then you really brings white supremacy and just sharp focus, just like mm -hmm. what America, you know, it, it considers dangerous or threatening, you know, like it's, it's, just an incredible story. It's inspiring. Also like acupuncture has changed my life. I was a chronic migraine sufferer still and was taking tons of medication and Mario, like just acupuncture, just it's rarely that it's just acupuncture. It's like acupuncture and breathing and like Mario taking my pulse and being like, why are you so stressed out? You know, like just, and this is mm -hmm. stuff, this is how Matulo talks. Like sometimes when I, when he calls, he can tell in my voice if I'm stressed out or something and that's how they were taught they were they were taught to to like look at how people were speaking what colors they were wearing you know like look in their mm -hmm. eyes like just this really caring community approach to um you know and their goals were just like in the immediate environment you know they were very idealistic they had but they were just like what can we do now to make a difference right here around us you know and it's just like this direct action there's just so much be about this story that is super inspiring and I think um, very resonating still. Right, you know, like when, when I started looking at it, I said, oh, this is a love story. You know, I, I totally see this as a, as a love story. Um, and all, what we know love stories, you know, can have some, um, some very intense and brutal moments. Um, today there is, let's say maybe the third or fourth wave of a heroin epidemic in the United States. Ironically, <laughs> the shoe was on the other foot um, in terms of who initially, who the crises, where these communities were. What has been your conversations with Dr. Shakur in terms of this current crises and how a program that was holistic and more natural could play a part in dismantling it? Well, I think what every most of the activists I spoke to who were involved in in this history, Matulu included, have Matulu's perspective is a bit different because he's from he's he sees more like the consequences of the war on drugs. He's been inside since 1986, so he's seen just how you know the incarceration rates swelling and exploding because of people incarcerated for drugs, which is something that they understood in 1970 was going to be the consequences of the war on drugs. Like they talked about this in their political classes. And then, you know, 15 years later, Matulu is seeing it firsthand. They also, of course, talk about how suddenly once the opioid and heroin crisis is, is a more of a white problem, it's become suddenly, oh, it's a public health issue and not a criminal issue, which is something they were, they saw happening, you know, at that time, because it, it was considered more of a public health issue before the war on drugs, before Nixon and the Rockefeller laws. So, of course, that's obvious, you know, suddenly there's a different approach to talking about addiction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the same things, I mean, but also it's full circle in the same way that, suddenly, you know, the pharmaceutical companies are really you know, we're recognizing that role in a way. Yeah, I think, you know, you know, I always say karma is a black woman with braids in her hair. I'm telling you, I mean, <laughs> this, uh, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a serving of serious karma in this, you know, in this moment. And it's, it's, it's very sad. I, I was listening to, what was I listening to? And I cannot think, but it was, maybe it was some veterans um, but somebody basically said, if you continue to do these things to people, 
it will eventually leak into your own house, right? So this is, you know, what we're seeing. There's leakage everywhere, um, you know. Um, this is a question, and I think this, because when you deal, with, this is a question, it, it, it's more so of, two, it, it's a two-part two question. So let me just ask it. Were there anything, were, were there things or some kind of like weird, like interesting interactions or happenings in the making of this that made you kind of pause in terms of, am I being surveillance or am I being watched or did I hit a hot button issue? I've been asked that a lot by, by people who in the film, you know, like that, um, who are like, get ready, you know, um, <laughs> cause I'd come back and forth from Canada, but no, um, knock on, I mean, maybe that's just, you know, like being a white woman from Canada, you know, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I think that speaks to the, the, the privilege of white skin, you know, just being mm -hmm. like, hi, I'm, you know, going to <laughs> like, just, you know, going just mm -hmm. in terms of just traveling in space. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's possible. I, but no, I haven't had any of those moments. Um, really? So. When you work on this type of work, um, it becomes much more than a piece of art or even to show inspiration. What was your, I don't know if this is something that you ascribe to, what was like a spiritual moment or a moment where it just was far beyond, you knew that you were just a vessel of something far beyond maybe you could even think about, think of. Oh, that's a hard, I've never really thought of it like that. Um... I mean, I could say this, it's just, you know, this, all my documentaries, like I really immerse myself into the research and I understand the responsibility. Once a film is out, you're, that's a huge responsibility having, you know, this to re represent mm -hmm. people's lives. And this has been such a transformative experience getting to know Dr. Shakur and just really understanding the reality in a more visceral way of like the consequences of mass incarceration like visiting Dr. Shakur in prison and you know getting to know his family and understanding like also just being in the waiting room of prisons like with other families and talking to them and then you just realize this is so intense these are people's lives you know people are being taken away locked up for decades. Matul has a lot of resources in terms of like people being a political prisoner, you have a community outside fighting for you. And he is so grateful for that and recognizes that. But there's so many people who don't have that, you know, who don't have $10,000 to like, you know, do a psychiatric evaluation for, before their parole. Like it's, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many things that I think just being the white supremacy also just that in sharp focus, just how in unjust the world is, just how I think I naively said uh, was to Sekou, like, how is it better today than it was in mm -hmm. the 70s for a Black mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. in America? And he kind of laughed at me, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. so I think just things like this, like, just, it just changed a lot of mm, how I view the world. I'll never unsee it. Who are you talking about? Sekou Odinga? Sekou Odinga. When I interviewed okay. him, I, you know, it was just like some, a question where I was like, so how is it better today? <laughs> you know, like, what kind mm -hmm. of improvements has, like and, and he was just like laughed at me he's like it's not um you know it's it's not it hasn't really changed things haven't really changed that much mm. for uh in terms of racism in america and systemic racism and i see that you know so yeah what right. i didn't mean to just like trail that off but it's just oh, it's no, no. everything you know like it's it's so hard to say like i feel like I just have so much love and respect for Dr. Shakur. And it's just so heartbreaking when you get to know someone who's been inside for so long and it's so, so helpless, you know, we're so helpless to do, to do anything. And it, it you realize that you're living, that we're almost aliens in society. There's so many different mindsets. The mm -hmm. idea that these, this parole board can continue to just keep them locked up. It's the same parole board for mm -hmm. many times that are just like refuse to let this man free right yeah I was reading the stuff saying that because he says he's a political prisoner the idea is that he still holds these radical ideologies which will make 
um, a man who has bone cancer and <laughs> going through COVID twice, still violent. Uh, thus he must, you know, must he, thus he must remain. Couple of more questions. Why, there's always this, this question of what makes keeping um, somebody who's a member of the Black Panther Party, who's a part of the Shakur family, um, what makes you think politically important to maintain his incarceration? What are you, you think are the objectives now? Most people have died by this time. You know, like why, what makes him important to, to be incarcerated, to stay inside? I think it's as simple as just nobody wanting to be that, nobody in power having the courage to deal with some backlash. You know, I think it's just like, nobody wants to be that person to sign off because mm -hmm. they're, the backlash is from, you know, like the Blue Lives Matter point of view, like oh, the cop killer, yeah. The mm -hmm. cop killer and the impact statements of that community and the children of the police officers, but they never asked for the impact statements from, you know, the, the like Matulu's children or, you know, the other side. And so I think that there's just a lot of, um, I think it's really just that. I can't imagine that this judge who had the power to sign for his compassionate release really believes he's a threat. It's by the FBI's own numbers, individuals over 70 have a zero, pretty much 0% recidivism rate. Mm. So mm. It's, it's, just, um, it's just political, it's, there's no rationale. So what can, because there are people who are looking at this that might want to do something to move something, what can be done? Well, there's a, we, uh, Matulu's family, friends and legal support team have a website called matulushakor.com and it's updated con continuously on um, different call to actions. Right now, there is a petition that people can sign, but the best thing would be to register for the newsletters of the site. And then when something comes up when there is a call to action, whether that be like, um, you know, phone calls or like letters or whatever. Right now it's like this period where people are just trying to figure out what action to do next because he's just, like you mentioned earlier, been denied compassionate release and parole. And, you know, so nice. it's trying to figure out, um, you know, it's a lot of strategy. You have, it's so difficult to fight these cases and Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's still hope, right? So that's right. So last question, you talked about how each documentary you dig into it, how has this transformed you? I mean, it's, yeah, it's like, I feel it's made me so much more patient and caring with people. Um, I see, you know, Dr. Shakur, he's inside, he's been, you know, his freedom has been restricted. He's, but he's still so, he just, he's so um, active. He's still, he's still working so hard. Uh, I don't know, I feel like I'm still in the midst of it. I think just, you know, it's just part, I, I'm definitely much more um, engaged with, the power that documentaries can be to, 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 you know, I just really hope that my documentaries can continually, um, each story can open people's, get people involved and provide counter narratives and just, um, um, <laughs> sorry, that was no. a messy answer, but I think, um, girl, you an artist. It's okay. <laughs> we, we think inside, outside, around yeah. side, everything. It is, it is all good. No, the, you. what you have, taking on is such a heavy project. And I think sometimes we don't even understand how many layers it is to it and how much we get so entrenched into it, right? And until somebody asks us, well, what about this? You're like, oh my gosh, nobody's ever. So you are debriefing. I understand you're debriefing, you know, and you know, as, as you're going, but I totally understand. And anybody I think that can listen is, is that we, in between the stops and the pauses and everything is a lot, it's very profound. And the work that you're doing is extremely profound and necessary. I really like, you said counter narratives to continue to create counter narratives. That's so important. I'm gonna always leave the last kind of thoughts to 
to the guests. If there's anything I didn't ask, anything you need for us to know, please let us know. Cute tat, by the way. I saw that tat. That was dope. Um, <laughs> um, I think I just really encourage people to watch the film and learn more about political prisoners and to write letters. If you, uh, Dr. Shakur has very little, especially with COVID. He doesn't have, he can't have visitors. He has very limited time to even go out of his room or cell to make a phone call or talk to other people. So letters are so important right now um, because they, he does receive them. I think if we can all just get involved and write some of our political prisoners letters and um, check out and just get more informed and you know. And even postcards, people postcards. can even, if they're not writers, send a postcard. Um, there are, you know, you know, different ways, a poem, a haiku, just having that engagement with the outside world helps. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it, it means a lot. I mean, Matula is always thankful for that because since the film come, came out and a lot of people have been writing about it. And I think it means a lot to him right now um, because they need to know that they're not alone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That yeah, there. that's. I did forget one last question. I apologize. Um, it's known that when your loved one does time, you do time. And you mentioned his kids. Yeah. How is the Shakur family? There, I'm, I'm very close with Mokrin Shakur, his son, who is amazing. It's difficult, you know, like I, I mean, he's, that's his relationship with his dad has been for the last 35 years visiting him in these really awful conditions. Some, you know, visiting Matu when he was in Victorville. Um, just you witness like the psychological warfare of just visiting people inside. Like they would, it's just very uncomfortable. The AC, like just, they just make it very difficult. So it's it's been obviously challenging but he's mm -hmm. very grateful to the support that his dad has and mm -hmm. and Victorville's the desert so it gets very hot in Victorville yeah, yeah. the last time I visited the the air conditioners were so were it was so freezing in there the guards are wearing like jackets and hoodies and toques and like we weren't allowed to wear sweaters or jackets inside no no jackets oh, wow. inside and they took away the vending machines so like children you know you're you're to make the, the, the experience very uncomfortable, you know? So it's just things like that that you see, you're just like, how can this be healthy? You know, <laughs> like you, mm -hmm. you, how can you not recognize the, the need for family? And um, mm. uh, it's, it's all very awful. But, but um, we push forward and in the words of, brother Dr. Matulu Shakur, Stiff Resistance. And if anybody wants to get in contact with you, where can we find you? Um, you can go, I have a uh, website, miadonovan.com or I Still Film, which is the documentary film company's website. Mm -hmm. So you can see all the other films that um, I Still Film is doing, so. Thank you so Thanks. very much. I appreciate you, thank you. Thank you so much. We got the cure, we got the answer to what's happening in society. We got the power to solutions and provide the healing that you need. We got the cure, we got the answer with discussions that will set you free. This is the Ark Republic and you're listening to The Remedy, The Remedy, The Remedy.